Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm going to get going. We got everybody? Okay, so this is a lecture that ostensibly is about detectors, um, but really, we only we care about the detectors because they're interesting. But what we really care about here is the intensity value in the image and how we are getting from the optical image to the digital image. So we've we've you know the last couple of lectures have talked a lot about how we collect photons and the importance of collecting a lot of signal photons. Um, somehow we get those photons to a detector uh, on on the point scanner as we saw. We're we're scanning a a beam across your sample and some flux of photons is coming back at us. Uh, in the um, camera-based systems that you'll see on like a spinning disc, which we'll, 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 we'll talk about later. Um, again, we're just sort of projecting an image onto something that magically gives you a set of numbers. And in as much as we're doing quantitative microscopy, obviously it's those numbers that we're doing something with. So it's, it's pretty critical that we have a, a, a good understanding of, of exactly what a 10 means in your image or a 50, like where does that number come from and what does it relate to your sample? And that's the, the crux of, of what we're talking about here. So digital images fundamentally contain two types of information, not too surprising to say. There's obviously spatial information, which basically just refers to where in your sample this bit of information came from. Um, we talked about spatial sampling, right? So generally we've got some pixels that have some finite size. They're not infinitely small. So we have some, some chunk of space in your sample that is represented by a single measurement. Um, and then for each of those chunks of space in your sample, there's gonna be an intensity value and that's one number, right? So we've got intensity information as a number and spatial information as a location. And the process of digital imaging is converting photons in your continuous optical image to intensity values in the digital image. Sometimes we call them gray values, intensity values, arbitrary values, whatever. I tend to use the term intensity values, but if you hear grayscale values, or if I slip and say something like that, it's all the same thing. An important point though here is that this is not directly photons. So when you see a 10 in your image, in most cases, that doesn't mean you collected 10 photons. There are Probably some cases where either randomly it does or uh, they were specifically in some mode where it does, but in general, don't assume that you're looking at the number of photons per pixel. And right, so as I give this lecture, I'm gonna be talking about sort of intermingling discussions of two broad classes of detectors. There are spatial detectors like cameras, like what you got in your phone or anywhere. Um, uh, and these generally fall into two categories. There are charged coupled devices and CMOS or complementary metal oxide semiconductor. We're, I have one slide on the difference between these two things, but for the purpose of this talk, let's just say, you know, we've got spatial detectors that can immediately um, collect a full image. And then there are non-spatial detectors. Uh, these are essentially like single pixel cameras, if you like to think about it like that. And a photodiode is an example of that, and a PMT or a photomultiplier tube is an example of that. Um, these are the ones that we are mostly using with point scanning confocals, or these non-spatial detectors. So we use a non-spatial detector, and then we build up an image sequentially, and, and um, as you've already seen. Uh, and up here we have um, cameras that are used for things like wide field uh, microscopy, or spinning disk confocal will also use a camera and not like a PMT. Whenever you see this icon, um, it, it, it sort of means that this concept maybe applies more specifically to camera detectors. Um, it's a tricky lecture to give because sometimes people are, are thinking in context of point scanners and other people in the audience are thinking in context of cameras. There's a lot of overlapping concepts, but there's some subtly, subtle differences, and I just want to make sure not to uh, confuse you on those points. But what they all have in common is the conversion of photons to intensity value. And that's really the crux of this um, uh, lecture. And so for most of it, we're gonna really ignore the spatial component, even for cameras. And we're gonna just consider like a single pixel in the camera or the, the PMT, the single, single pixel photo detector. And we're gonna talk about how we go from photons to intensity values. And there's gonna be a couple conversions in this process. And of course, every conversion of information is an opportunity for loss. So we need to understand how, you know, how, how does this conversion, um, uh, how do we lose information? How does it add noise to, to our measurement? Um, 
specifically in, in all of the detectors, we're going to go from photons and capture those photons in some way as electrons. Those electrons are going to go through some amplification process, uh, get converted into a voltage, and it's the voltage ultimately that we can digitize with what's called an analog to digital converter into a number. So this is what we're going to step through in, in um, a little bit of detail. And it's not really critical that you, you know, fundamentally understand the, you know, electronical engineering going on here. It, it's interesting, and if you like to get into it, um, what we're really trying to emphasize, though, is just to be uh, um, have have some awareness of, about what variance means in your image. What are the sources of noise, and uh, what can we make of a of a number in our image? I will also say, feel free to like interrupt me. I I'm more than happy to have questions as we go, rather than all of the answers. Okay, so all detectors are going to take advantage of what we call the photoelectric effect. It's this super cool quantum mechanic effect that basically says if you shine a bunch of photons onto some material, usually metal, um, some materials have this property where when they absorb a photon, the energy that they absorb gets converted into a, a liberated electron. So maybe you have a uh, a lattice of, of silicon here, just a, a, a crystal lattice of silicon. And when it absorbs some energy from a photon, maybe you can liberate one of the electrons in the silicon atoms to kind of move around the material or perhaps just pop off of the material. And that's called the photoelectric effect. Okay. And all detectors are going to do this in some way, shape, or form. Cameras do this with an array of what we call a photodiode. So if this is a, 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 a schematic of a, of a camera chip, we've just got an, a, a, an array of light sensitive elements where each pixel in your ultimate image uh, relates to one photodiode on the chip. And if we did sort of a cutaway of each photodiode, it's essentially this thing that has some light sensitive silicon. And by light sensitive, I mean it's capable of undergoing that photoelectric effect. We're going to shine some light. And it, and it tends to go through a bunch of like electrical connections. This is not dissimilar to the retina, actually, where there's a bunch of stuff that we need to kind of read out the image that the light has to shine through before it hits the light sensitive stuff. So that's, that's a pretty common way of, of, of arranging these. So the light comes in, hits the, um, in this case, silicon, and has some probability of kicking out a free electron. And then over the course of the exposure, we're going to collect those electrons in what we call the potential well. So this is just a mass of silicon that can accumulate if you, you know, apply some voltages to kind of shove the liberated electrons into a little bucket. And so think of this as the bucket that's collecting electrons over the course of the exposure. Now this bucket has a maximum size, can only fill up so far before uh, you 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 can't collect anymore, and that's definitely tightly related to the concept of saturation. Um, but we'll we'll call this the 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 size of this thing the full well capacity. So a given camera, again, we're on cameras, a given camera will have a maximum full well capacity, which is essentially the, the total number of electrons you can accumulate before it just kind of fills up and more light is not going to increase the number of electrons. Okay. Um, later, we'll use these electrical connections to measure the electrons, but we're not there yet. At the moment, we're just converting photons to electrons. Point scanners use these sort of single pixel detectors. Um, and the, by far the most common is a photomultiplier tube. So this is a, a clever little device that essentially has a light sensitive material. So here's the photocathode. It's a little bit different than the, the ones we saw in the photodiode, but the concept is the same. Light comes in, um, photon comes in, hits this, it, it, it sort of kicks out a free electron on the other side. And in this case, we're going to go through a multiplication process. I'll, I'll talk about this again on a, on a later slide. But for now, just recognize that one photon maybe makes one electron. And then it gets multiplied into a bunch of electrons. The, the sort of teaser for why we need this is that a single electron is, is pretty hard to measure with confidence. There's additional noise in the system. And if you kick out one electron, it's going to be pretty hard to reliably measure it. And so. I'll get back to this, but basically here what we're doing is we're just saying, I really want to detect that little teeny signal that I just converted to an electron, so I'm going to um, crank it up to a bunch. And, and this is a, a, a process called impact ionization, where if you essentially take an electron and you ram it into these dynos, additional pieces of metal, you have some probability of kicking out 
another electron. So you get one electron in and maybe you get two out. And then you repeat that again and again and again. And over you know a number of steps, you can end up with, say, 1,000 or 10,000 electrons coming out the other side. So now we can at least detect that single photon that hit the photocat. Okay. And then at the other end, we have an anode which collects current and sends it somewhere where we can measure. There are variants on this. I'm not really going to get into it. They each have sort of merits of, uh, of, of how they work. Um, I will just point this out in case anybody has a Leica. There's a, uh, the, the Leica has a high D detector, which is a subtle variant of this. Um, well, maybe not so subtle, depends on who you talk to. Um, it still just has a light sensitive piece of material, photocathode, converts it to an electron. It's just that the middle bit has a, a pretty different way of amplifying, uh, which has its own uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, and if anybody has a like, I'm happy to sort of talk about this. It, it does make for some differences in how you need to evaluate the gray values. But at the end of the day, we're just converting light to an electron, multiplying it to a bunch of electrons, and then measuring it. Now, in a perfect world, every sort of, you know, every time a photon hits this, we would get an electron out. But that is definitely not the way it works, unfortunately. And there is this uh, metric called quantum efficiency that is super important for any detector. And it is the wavelength dependent probability that an incident photon that hits that photosensitive material will actually generate an electron, right? So sometimes it's just going to kind of pass through and not interact with the material. Sometimes, you know, maybe it'll, it'll get absorbed, but kind of dissipate as heat and not liberate an electron. You never know. Um, and each material has a different sort of property. So this is an example of just a random camera from a, a Hamamatsu's website that, that's showing us the wavelength dependent probability. So this camera has, you know, about a 70%, 72% chance if you shine maybe, you know, 580 nanometer light somewhere in the orangish red um, uh, of, of, of being detected, of, of converting to an elect of electron. However, if you shine far red light, you know, 90% of the time, it's not going to register. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's very important to look at the quantum efficiency of your detector, particularly if you're in some sort of far red regime. If you're specifically imaging far red, you should make sure that you're using a detector that is actually sensitive to that. Now, I want to point out here that this does not mean that this detector has color sensing capability, right? This is a black and white detector. It's a monochromatic detector that has some probability of detecting a photon and that probability varies depending on the, the wavelength of the photon, but it is not, it can't discriminate between a 500 and a 600 nanometer photon. Good. So different materials, silicon, gallium arsenide, like different materials have dramatically different quantum efficiencies and different detectors have dramatically different quantum efficiencies. And this is really one of the major, when, when, we, when, we, when we sort of say, oh, point scanners, they're less sensitive, one of the one of the huge reasons is, is of course we've got a pinhole and we're rejecting we're rejecting a bunch of light, but a but a very big reason is at the end of all that after you have got your precious few photons to the detector, point scanners use PMTs which typically have very poor quantum efficiency. So the first generation PMT um, uh, had generally a, almost a maximum of twenty maybe twenty five percent quantum efficiency. The the newfangled um, gas detectors that you see um, are somewhere around 40 to 45 percent. So that means, you know, you're losing over half of the photons that made it all the way through the pinhole and got to your detector. They just get failed to be registered. And that's a big bump. Um, cameras have very high quantum efficiency. This one is showing 80, but, you know, as you've probably all seen, there's uh, the Prime 95B and a bunch of Hamamatsu and Andor cameras that have quantum efficiencies on the order of 95 percent. So this is a, a big benefit of a camera basin. There's a reason we can't just use, yeah, go ahead. This might be, why not use silicon photodiodes to detect? On a confocal? Great question. And I will get to it next. Yeah. So before I get directly to that, consider for a moment that in a camera, you know, we sort of open the shutter and we expose the whole camera over the course of the exposure, right? Like each pixel in the image gets to accumulate light for the whole exposure. We're not saying, okay, your turn, now your turn, now your turn. They, they all get to go at the same time. And so each pixel in the image receives light for the duration of the exposure. And if you've 
you know, I, I, I suspect most of you have done some camera-based imaging and, and you'll know that the exposure times we tend to use are somewhere on the order of a millisecond. That would be a very short exposure to, you know, upwards of a second. That'd be a long exposure. But we're in the millisecond range. In a point scanner, every pixel, we talked about dwell time yesterday, that's it. It gets one chance and it gets the received light for just the dwell time of that pixel. And these tend to be on the order of microseconds or even tens of nanoseconds, right? So somewhere between maybe 50 nanoseconds for like a resonant scanner to five or 10 microseconds for a slow point scanner. That's about 10,000, that's five orders of magnitude less time to collect light. So if you don't want your thing to take forever, point scanners basically need a detector that has to be crazy, crazy fast. And because in the course of 50 nanoseconds, you don't collect a lot of photons. Not only does it need to be fast, it needs to be capable of amplifying these minuscule levels of light. Um, and that's why we get to PMTs. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about the multiplication here. But one, just because you asked the question, you could imagine a scenario in which you sort of take the output of a confocal and you re-scan it onto a camera. Um, so, so in most cases, when we use a point scanner, we're, we're sweeping a beam across the sample and then a, a mirror sort of unsweeps that, right? The emission light gets focused onto one detector that's not moving around, right? We de-scan the emission light onto one detector that we don't have to move around. So if you wanted to now introduce a sensitive two-dimensional array, you would need some way to redo it, right? You would need to re-scan that point. What if you just add like one? Um, uh, if you had one pixel, that would be fine. Your your QE would be good, but the vast majority of the time, these cameras, um, their readout is on the rate of you know millisecond, right, or, or no microseconds, right. But like it 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 generally, the electronics of cameras are not designed to be able to do something on the order of nanoseconds, right. So the the readout time of cameras can't keep up with what you need in a point scanner. Good question. Um, so these are the demands on a, on a detector of a point scanner. And so PMTs, so this now gets to this, this um, multiplicative business. Um, and actually, I, I'm, 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 there's another bit of hand waving I'm going to be doing here, which is to say, why, do we, why can't we just detect a single electron in the first place? Why do we need to amplify at all? And the reason for that is a, is a phenomenon called read noise or detector noise that I'll get to in a couple slides. But for now, suffice it to say that Confidently detecting one electron is very hard just because there's noise in a system. And I'll talk about that. It's called read noise. And so what we need to do, if we want to be really confident about that one, if we want to simply be confident that it happened to detect it in the first place, we're going to multiply. It. And that is this, this multiplication process. So the, this whole thing happens super fast and it's capable of amplifying these super weak signals that we collect in tens of nanoseconds or microseconds to some detectable level. And they're awesome for that. Um, but it comes with a cost, and that is multiplicative noise. Um, this is a um, somewhat tricky concept, but I like to think about it like this. So this is a graph here that is showing the probability on the y-axis of observing a given number of output electrons at the end of this chain, given a certain number of electrons in. So let's just walk through this. So the black line here is saying, OK, let's say I give you one input electron which is what's shown in this diagram. If I tell you, I give you one input electron, depending on how it goes through here, you might get a different number of output electrons. This, this, this is a probabilistic phenomenon, right? And actually the most likely scenario is that you get zero output electrons. In other words, that it gets lost somewhere along the way. It can happen, um, but you may get 500 and you may get 750 and with diminishing steps. As you add more in, you know, the, the, the chances of getting zero out get less and less. But what you'll notice here is it gets spread, right? So, so you're not going to get 1,000 every time. You might get 1,200. And to put this another way, if you planted yourself here, with, let's say you are the digitizer, and you're saying, and your question is how much light hit the chip in the first place, because that's ultimately what we're here for, right? We're here to say how many photons came from this stuff. So if you're right here and you and you see an output of 750 electrons there, well, it could have been one, could have been two, could have been three, could have been four, right? So what we've gained here is the ability to detect light, weak light, but we've sort of lost the ability to have much confidence about the absolute magnitude. The precision with which we can measure it has been quite a bit. So that's 
multiplicative noise. And for those of you who are aware of electron multiplying CCDs, EM CCDs, uh, these guys use a very similar concept. Um, at albeit, th what I'm showing you here is really an EM CCD graph, but the, 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 the concept is the same. And th the main thing that differs is just the degree of gain, just how much we're amplifying uh, is much, much more on a PMT than an EM CCD. But at the end of the day, they're both there to detect weak light levels with full awareness you should have that you have lost some uh, quite a bit of precision in your ability to to directly measure. Okay. Um, this is a thing that gets sort of said in many different ways. If you if you if any of you have um, the confocal handbook from uh, Paulie, he, he likes to say that multiplicative noise effectively halves the quantum efficiency of a detector. And um, I, I don't want to get into that, but, but the, 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 this, this, this phenomenon of multiplicative noise pops up in discussions a lot. And you should recognize that it is just a, a, a detrimental impact of using any detector that, that multiplies. Sometimes you have to because it's a weak signal, um, right? So here's a good example of, of, of in, a, in an EM CCD, same exact camera, same exposure time. And all I've done here is turned on the EM gain. Maybe it's better over here. I'm not sure. Um, uh, so uh, on the right side, you can sort of see the phylopodia, perhaps, right, of the little actin there, which are basically lost in the noise over here. So we've we've detected something. Fantastic. If you're trying to track an object or merely say, is it there? We have much more confidence over here than we did there, right? Um, but if we were trying to say how much actin is there, and let's say I had slightly more light than this image, then using that additional sort of gain is, has actually made my measurement harder. There's no right answer here. It really depends on the regime you're in. If you're in a ridiculously low light level, like we are with a point scanner, you have to. You got no choice. Um, if you're on a spinning disk or a wide field system where you have the luxury of perhaps collecting more light, then maybe that's better. So it depends. OK. Um, so we've, con we've collected some photons, converted them to electrons. Uh, maybe we've done it over here in a PMT or in a, in a, in a photodiode, and now we need to measure them. So this is the process of readout. Um, so we're going to sort of close, you know, in the case of a camera, right, we're going to close some electrical gate and let these electrons flow somewhere. Um, same thing could be said here, let the electrons flow somewhere, and that somewhere is an amplifier that converts this current of flowing electrons on a wire to a voltage. And so now the, the, the x-axis here is time. Um, in a point scanner, this sort of feels intuitive. This is the time as we scan the beam across your sample, we're going to hit some bright objects, and then we're going to hit some dim objects. And so it's going to look like this. In a camera, think of this as one pixel closing the gate, and then the next pixel closing the gate, and then the next pixel closing the gate. So this would be like one pixel, and another pixel, and another pixel, and another pixel, OK? So as each pixel delivers its charge packet of electrons to the amplifier, we convert it to a voltage. And that voltage output is directly proportional to the number of input electrons. But there is imprecision here. So conversion always comes with noise. And this is a probably the, the, the biggest source of noise, definitely in a camera. And it's called read noise. So you can think of this as um, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll show you this image here. So this is a, a super useful image, even though it doesn't look all that exciting. And this is an image where I just put the lens cap on the camera and I took an image. And uh, can anybody gather why I might be so excited about a picture of absolutely nothing? Yeah. It, it's a known, right? So just like we put beads on the microscope to detect, the, uh, to, to measure the point spread function, to say something about the optics of our instrument, we can say something about the detector by putting a known on there. And really the only known you can deliver to a camera, easily at least, is nothing. So we put the lens cap on there. And what I want you to notice is it didn't report the same number every time. We know the ground truth here, it's zero, right? Zero photons hit this camera. But each time, each, each opportunity to measure zero, each pixel is another opportunity to measure zero, and it gave us a different number. That's noise, right? That's read noise. Now, you're going to see a different sort of result if you do this on a point scanner. If you 
you know, try to deliver no light to a point scanner, you'll probably see mostly black pixels and maybe every so often you'll see like a speck. So this is definitely like a phenomenon that has a more readily understandable uh, uh, explanation in a camera, um, but this concept, yeah. Um, oh, this here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, and actually, it was the <laughs> uh, Anyway, so there is noise, right? There is noise in this conversion. Um, and uh, on a camera, at least, putting a lens cap on and, and measuring this, the, the, the standard deviation of this would be a direct measurement of, of your noise. And it's always there. Um, it, it, in every image, you, you have this variance. Now, we, we can collect more and more photons to escape this noise, right? So if we see a bright object here, it will stick out above the noise. So, right, that, and, and that's why we do that. But um, know that in every pixel, you know, if you measured it again and again and again, you would get a little bit of a different number every time. And that's not just because of Poisson noise, like we talked about, right? We talked about the sample itself having some intrinsic variability, but the detector also adds some variability. Um, I'll give you a quick demo of this. This is a camera simulator that I made that's on the Hamamatsu website that, again, it's really more for cameras, but the, the point here is you can go in, I'll give you the link later, and, and sort of tweak each individual um, metric on a camera and sort of see what the, the result of your image would be. But what I want to play with here is imagine we have a detector and we can change the noise. This is not something you get to do. Cameras have generally a noise, or maybe if they have different readout speeds, like if I can read out faster, but noisier or slower, but quieter, they might have a couple different modes, but generally your detector has a noise characteristic. And here's just an image of nothing, right? And I'm doing a line scan across it and showing you the line scan here. And what you should think of noise as is just, you know, the standard deviation there is I, is I have less and less noise, it gets quieter. And, I, and my attempt to measure zero is the same thing each time. Now I truly am getting the same value every time. It may not actually be that the intensity of value is zero. That's a, another thing, but it's gonna be the same every time, right? Um, whereas if it gets noisier and noisier, um, uh, that's, that's essentially happening. And now the problem, of course, is once we add some dim signal here, like a bead, if I turn on auto scaling here, the, the problem with noise is that will get lost in it, right? So if I have a camera or a detector with very, very low noise, I have no problem whatsoever detecting these things, right? Let me move the line scan here. So we're looking at some weak, some objects here, right? But if I had noise, our ability to detect that gets lost, okay? So we either need a way to somehow, you know, we either need to collect more light to begin with by increasing our exposure time, or we need some way, like like I said, with the multiplication to to get to get above that. Um, anyway, so the crux of the story here is that read noise limits our ability to do signals. Jennifer showed you this, right? So, uh, in a regime where you've got low noise, high you know has low, low noise, we can we can detect these weak beads. In a high noise situation, we lose. On a camera, read noise is independent of exposure time. So this is why you use longer exposure time. So as you collect more light over the duration of the exposure, the read noise is not changing. There's still this sort of constant variance um, uh, when I read it out. So here's a dim little bead that has some fluorescence around the edge. And Jennifer just took increasingly longer exposure times. And what I want you to notice is like out here on the edge, it's actually kind of the same, right? There, there's a little bit of variance out there. It doesn't go away. It, it stays. In fact, maybe a little bit more variance there as we had Poisson noise being added. But we've escaped the read noise with a bright out, with, with a bright signal. So this is, you know, why collecting more photons is always sort of useful. Now, there's a common point of confusion here, and this is where we get a little bit back to PMTs. Um, systems like PMTs and electron multiplying cameras that have this 
this thing going on here where they take a weak level of input and they amplify it to a lot. Those systems are often reported as having no read noise. So here is a specification sheet for an electron multiplying CCD where they're telling us that noise and they say, okay, if the gain is high, which is how generally if you're using the EM mode, you'll turn the gain up. They say these have a read noise of one electron max. And, and the units here, when we say a read noise of one electron, it basically means the precision I can give you is however many electrons plus or minus one, right? Like if it, like my, my variance, the, the magnitude of variance in my measurement is about one electron. So you can, you can, you can sort of think, all right, well, that means I'm going to have a hard time, you know, if it's 10 electrons variance, I'm going to have a really hard time measuring one electron hitting the chip, right? So that's the unit there. Um, but, but here they're just saying it's, it's almost nothing, maximum of one electron, so it's negligible. And the subtle point I'm trying to make here is that, that PMTs and EMCCs still do have this concept of conversion noise, but by multiplying the signal before you read it out, you make it essentially negligible. Okay, so that so so there's 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 read noise of the detector. It's a big it's a problem for cameras. In PMTs, we sort of say it's not a problem because we've pre-amplified the signal with that multiplication step. The multiplication step added its own problems, but read noise is now not a problem. Um, that uh, yeah. So I'm gonna ask if there's any questions there. Uh, does that roughly make sense that on a camera we have a sort of digitization uh, detector noise? We increase exposure times to get above it. On a PMT, we have we multiply the signal, a weak signal, so that this detector noise is less of a problem. But in doing so, we add a new problem: the multiplication, the inability, the like imprecision in our measurement. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that there's a way to estimate the read noise. Is there a way to estimate the read noise? Yes. Uh, she said that you can estimate the read noise not so hard by putting a lens cap on and looking at the standard deviation of your image. Is there a way to measure the multiplicative noise? And uh, I, I will say I've never done it. it. It's really hard. I mean, like, you could, I, I, I am sure that a, a electrical engineer could give us some sort of strategy, but I've never actually seen a biologist on a microscope estimate that. It, it, it depends on a lot of things that are really hard to control for. Um, it, it will be, you, you, can, you can sort of hand wavy um, say that it essentially, what you will see said often is that it, is, it, it, can, it can often do something like double the Poisson. So in equations, you will often see people add this sort of noise factor when they're trying to account for this. And they just basically take the shot noise and they multiply it by two. Um, that is quite a hand wavy thing. And it's not very satisfying to me. And if it's not to you, I, I, I don't blame you. But um, the answer is no, it's very hard to estimate um, directly. But there is a thing that people just do when they're trying to say, ah, oh, there's multiplicative noise. And that is like, add this factor of two. I can show you that in an equation. All right, so up till this point, we've just been dealing with you know electrons and voltages and there's been nothing digital about this at all. So now is the step where we convert our voltage to gray values. Um, and this happens at an analog to digital converter. So this is just a device in the instrument that basically takes in voltage and spits out a discrete number. Uh, in other words, we, we are discretizing this. What comes in is a continuous value of voltage that can be, you know, between any two voltages, there's always a halfway point, right? Um, and what comes out is integer values discretized um, into, into, into intensity values. So as it goes higher, this goes higher. But what we'll never see here is a decimal value. We'll never see an intensity value of like 100.5 or negative values. Okay. Yep. Is the amplifier also introduced noise? Yes, yeah. So the read noise we were seeing a second ago is, is predominantly at this step. Yeah. Okay. So the question now is, well, what does it get to pick from? You know, like why did I show you 26 and 204 here? Why not 2,000? Why not 40,000? Uh, 
Ah, right. Actually, before I get to the next slide here, I'll, I'll just say, you know, once we've digitized this sort of stream of voltage into a just discrete set of integers, that's your data. And what I'm showing here is essentially like one row of an image, maybe just the top row of your image. And, you know, we could potentially just show this as higher numbers as brighter on the monitor. And now we've got the first row of your image. And the answer to the question of what do I get to pick from, 200, 2,000, 20,000, is bit depth. Um, so bit depth in an image is the essentially the number of bits, ones and zeros, that the computer uses to store the information. So it's, it's essentially like how much space in your hard drive you are going to uh, devote to, to the information captured in each pixel in the image. Higher bit depth, more space, more information can be captured. And it determines the number of distinct possible intensity values that any pixel in your image could have. And the rule is that you go two to the bit depth, and that tells you the possible number of intensity values. So an 8-bit image has 2 to the 8th is 256, but we include 0. So it's basically 0 to 255. So in an 8-bit image, you'll never see anything higher than 255. If you see 255, you can say that we've essentially saturated the analog to digital converter. Right, so it's never going to give us anything higher. Twelve bit, we'll never see anything higher than fourteen ninety five. Sixteen bit, we'll never see anything higher than six five thousand five hundred thirty five. So they're arbitrary; they don't really mean anything. They are just telling you what do we got to work with? How many numbers do I have to work with? Um, right. So it's it's always important to be aware of the bit depth you're working in, mostly because you kind of want to have in the back of your mind what is my highest possible value and what is my dynamic range and where where am I in my range? Am I you know if I'm on a 16-bit detector and I see my maximum intensity is 200, I know I have a tremendous amount of headroom left to work with, and perhaps I would turn up the gain or you know stuff. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Um, you still when you're on the yeah, let me um, let me do the next couple slides, and I think it'll make more sense. So you could look at this. Uh, actually, let me let me say another way. You know, another way to think about this is that the analog to digital converter does what we call quantizes the continu continuous voltage output into one of these discrete intensity values. So let's say I had this is my sample. It's just a smooth gradient from bright to dark. That's the true ground truth there. If I image that onto a one bit camera then I have two to the one is two possible intensity values. And this is what the image would look like here, this first column. In other words, I would not be able to discriminate the difference between that gray and that gray and that gray. They would all just appear white in my image and everything below here would appear black. And as I add bit depth, I am able to chop that up into finer and finer bits. So in a way, bit depth is the resolution with which I am sampling my intensity information. Um, now, there's a reason I sort of stopped here at 8 bits, and that is uh, the projector is very likely an 8-bit detector, so it couldn't even show me more than 256 gray values if I wanted it to. And even if I wanted it to, your eyeballs wouldn't be able to tell the difference because best case scenario, you can only discriminate something on the order of 200, 250 gray values, okay? So you could look at this and say, well, that's always, it keeps getting better. I'm just going to chop it up into more and more finer things and I'll get better and better information. And that's a lie. Uh, the What you really care about here is dynamic range. So dynamic range tells you the total number of discernible intensity values in your image. So, so, so bit depth tells you the number of maximum intensity values you could have. And this concept of dynamic range says, well, how many useful intensity values do I have? Like how much, you know, like, can I can I really detect the difference between two very, very subtly different intensity values, and that comes to dynamic range. So you can think of it as the number of discrete intensity levels in the optical image that the detector can successfully discriminate. Like, how much brighter do I need something to be than its neighbor for me to say with confidence, yeah, that's that's truly a brighter object, or is it just noise? And this, this is dynamic range. So for a camera, the definition of dynamic range is very often the maximum measurable intensity to the minimum. And if you remember in the beginning, I said, you know, let's see, our maximum measurable intensity is, is a, a, a proxy for that might be, what is the total number of photons we can collect? And I said, there's this bucket. And once you fill it up, you're done. So that's a good metric for your maximum. It's your full well capacity. That's the most photons I can collect. 
And the minimum measurable intensity is a little harder to define. On a camera, we have said that read noise limits our ability to detect weak signals, right? So we know that we need something to be at least above the read noise to detect it. So let's say that the amount of electron read noise, uh, the, the read noise in units of electron is a good sort of estimate of the minimum measurable intensity. And if I take that on a typical camera, you know, this will, this will totally depend on the camera, but let's say the camera spec sheet said I have 18,000 full well capacity and a, and a read noise of six electrons. That would then tell me that that camera could, could successfully discriminate something on the order of 3,000 intensity. Now we get back to bit depth. So basically what we need is our bit depth on our camera to be at least as much as the dynamic range that we are, are able to detect. So here in this camera, which can, the camera has the ability to dis discriminate 3000 intensity values. If I chop that up into only 256 gray values on my analog to digital converter, then I've lost information. If I chop it up into 65,000, I still only have a dynamic range of 3,000. So in other words, there is no point in having a bit depth with significantly greater bits than the dynamic range. And this is a very common sort of thing that you'll see on point scanners. Um, uh, if you have the ability to adjust it, um, sometimes you'll, you'll someone will train you and say, turn it up as high as possible because then you're getting the most intensity information and you're not. It, it really depends on the dynamic range that you have in your image. There's no downside to having a higher bit depth except file size and perhaps the fooling of yourself, right? So don't fool yourself in thinking you're getting more information just by chopping it up into finer and finer bins. Dynamic range is the thing that really matters. Um, and most cases in a point scanning confocal, eight bits is, is more than sufficient to capture the dynamic range. Yeah. Um, I'm Yeah, so you're getting to the next point, which is gain. So essentially, you're right. We've got these fixed zero to something, and we've got some voltage coming in. And you're absolutely right. If our voltage was sort of stuck in this low area, we'd have a lot of rounding, in, right? So we need some way to stretch it across the dynamic range, and that is gain. So gain and offset are, you know, we talk about them in a lot of different contexts, but really all gain and offset are are the tools you have to stretch your your light level, the, the voltage we've gotten from electrons successfully converted from photons across the dynamic range of our analog to digital converter. They don't really do anything but that. They are just there to help you with the conversion. Okay, so yeah, so I think about them as they, they are used to distribute the detected light levels. Think about this on the x-axis, we've got some light level from low light to high light. And for each incoming light level, we're gonna have some intensity value in the image that's on the y-axis. And of course, you know, when we reach the top of the y-axis, we can't get any higher than the maximum possible intensity value, that's saturation. And all, all gain and offset are is the is the slope and offset of this of this relationship. Okay. So offset on any detector is essentially the intensity value that corresponds roughly to zero photon. It's the it's the it's the baseline intensity value. It's the intensity value of 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 no light. It doesn't have to be zero. It could be a hundred. It could be a thousand. It's just the y-intercept of this relationship. And gain is the slope. It's basically how many intensity values do I get per electron, if you will, or yeah, right? So per photon. I could turn up the gain and give you higher intensity values with zero additional photons, right? It's just we're just stretching this voltage over the range of the of the analog to digital computer. I have a couple more slides on this. Um, so think of think of this as my my signal coming in. Um, maybe this is a bright object, dim object, bright object, dim object. If I were to add offset, then I am just you think of offset as an adder, you know, just like just like in, in the linear line, it's the M in the M uh, yeah. Yeah, right <laughs> Never mind. Um, uh, so here we we just added. Um, whereas gain is a multiplier. With gain, we 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 stretch, right? So if I increase the gain, 
I would take this and stretch it. So I'm getting higher intensity values for uh, um, uh, per electron. But note, I've also stretched the noise, right? So whatever variance was going on here, when I turn up the gain, I'm stretching that variance too. So gain is useful to stretch my voltage across the dynamic range of my analog to digital converter, but it is not, unless you have a, it's not gaining you any signal to noise ratio unless you had sort of artificially made it so low that you've lost, you know, information, right? What high gain will do in some cases, so, so if we think of gain as the slope here, this is like high gain, and we're basically saying, I don't need to get very many photons at all to reach saturation, right? Over here, I have low gain, and I will not reach saturation even with a high amount of, of light, right? And what I've done here is I've, I've essentially, you know, I've reached saturation at a very low number of photons. Now, if my goal was to collect a lot of photons, because I know that really at the end of the day, the only thing that's truly giving me signal to noise ratio is photons, then in this case, I'm actually, I'm reaching saturation without having collected a lot of photons, and I will have a lower signal to noise ratio than if I turned down the gain and turned up the laser. Now, of course, if I turn up the laser, I've got bleaching, toxicity, so compromise, but um, it's important to be aware of where your gain is because you can definitely be in a scenario where you are hitting saturation and sort of being all satisfied, thinking I filled the dynamic range of my chip or, or my detector, but um, you've done so with sort of fake intensity values that were just multiplied rather than real true photons. Make sense? And offset, uh, the, the point with offset is just that, you know, your, your digitizer doesn't allow negative intensity values. And there's always going to be a little noise, particularly in a camera, less so in a, in a read noise in a PMT, but there's always going to be a little noise. And you should just capture all the noise so you can have some, you know, you, you don't want to, just as you don't want to saturate on the top, you don't want to saturate on the bottom, right? We don't want clipping on the bottom, right? So if I decrease the offset, I might get this, you know, everything, the, the downward fluctuations would truncate on the low end. And so, you know, if you look at a point scanner, you often see these lookup tables that have saturation on the top, you know, saturated pixels as red and undersaturated pixels, zero intensity values as blue. And, you know, it, it's sort of, sometimes people will train you to say, you know, set this so that you, you get a bunch of blue pixels on the bottom and a couple red pixels on the top and you've sort of filled your dynamic range. I would just say, do that except don't have any blue pixels and don't have any red pixels right like uh don't uh like down here we've, we've set the offset such that everything in the background here is black and now that's going to be a very visually appealing image it's going to have a nice contrast but you could absolutely do that with this image after the fact just by changing the contrast so don't collect data the way you want to look at it collect data to fill your dynamic range and not saturate on either end, and then do whatever you want to make it as pretty as you want later in post, okay? Um, so here, gain is too high because we've got some red bits and we're saturating, and here, offset is too low because we've got some blue bits and we're undersaturating. And I, I will just say, the, another reason not to trust your eye here is like, in this image here, if I crank up the contrast after acquisition of the image, um, you'll see that up here where I didn't undersaturate, there actually is a, a little bit of information that I that I have not lost by, you know, have, uh, down here I've lost. It. So no reason to have zero intensity values in your image. And gain doesn't improve signal to noise ratio. I, I made this point before. This is just a really good example of it from Anna. Um, here I have a, a low gain image. Um, so it, uh, Anna has turned down the gain and then adjusted the laser power to keep the maximum intensity the same in each of these. So low gain, high laser, high gain, low laser. Obviously we're bleaching more over there than we are here, but if I'm only taking a single image, then I would much prefer the low gain, high laser image in terms of signal to noise ratio. Make sense? Okay, so this is just summarizing what I've just said. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to reread these sentences. I've just said all of this. Any questions at that point? I have a couple more slides, but I'll pause there. If it, yeah. Yes. I love this graph, the slide. The other one actually earlier that you showed a high-degree display. 
is a uh, the best illustration I try to explain this to people. I think the graph looks the best. We all know that when you increase the gain, you increase the noise, right? But what's more subtle here is that when you increase the gain, you also decrease your dynamic range. In fact, if you take this graph to the absurd extreme and just make your gain vertical, you end up with a binary image. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, but good, as you good said, point. Yeah. You want to stretch all of your available values across the dynamic range of the system. So that's why you do the game. You don't want to have yeah. all of your gray values between zero and 10. So game is often powerful, yeah. but be very aware. Yeah, and it's iterative, right? Like we often will start somewhere, see how we do, then we'll notice perhaps we have a nice stable bright sample and maybe we'll turn down the gain, turn up the laser, and then maybe we'll change it, right? So it's an iterative optimization. Okay. Oh, oh, I had more slides than I thought. Okay, no problem. Um, now, uh, how do we create a 2D image? Um, this is actually quite simple. Uh, in a point scanner, the 2D image is said that space is encoded in the temporal flux of photons coming back from the sample. So picture your laser, we're scanning it across the sample, and at any given instant in time, there is some number of photons coming back at me from the sample, and that tells me something about how many fluorophores there were in that part of the sample. And then, you know, so the, the emission light is coming back. We descan that onto some PMT. The PMT now converts to a voltage, and we digitize that, and one by one, we populate the pixels in the image. And that is how, you know, we build up a spatial image from a temporal sequence of photons. Does that make sense? So there, there, there's a lot, I mean, it's a very simple concept. And then within that is a lot of like complication. And most of the complication has to do with, well, what is a pixel and how big is a pixel? And and Uri talked to the, about that yesterday and we talked about that in the lab again, but um, but just remember that space is time in a point scanner. It, it like we encode space in time with coming off the detector. Now in a camera, Cameras can just detect spatial information directly, of course, because they have already an array of light sensitive elements. So I have some ghostly object here. It puts photons onto the chip. Those chip, those are converted to electrons. And now we need to measure them. And there is a lot that could be said about this readout process. For now, all I want to um, show you is that there is a sort of clever readout process. And it, it, it is this, watch. So, it, so basically, let's say we've collected some electrons. And now at the end of the exposure, we need to measure them. On a CCD, we need to get them all individually, one at a time, to a single amplifier that is going to do that conversion. And it happens like this. We start with a what's called a parallel shift. And if you saw that, where we basically each row shifts up one row. So there, um, the top row goes to a special off-chip register called the serial register. And everything else shifts one row up. And then we are going to one column at a time, shift them over to a special little node called the readout node that does what we've talked about. It converts the electrons to a charge, uh, a char charge to a voltage, and digitizes the voltage. Okay. And then when that row is done, the next row goes. And so, you know, this looks very similar to what we saw a second ago on the point scanner. We've just sort of first collected in space, and now we turn it into time, and, and, and then we get the stream, and then we know from which each uh, pixel, each intensity came from. There's a lot of subtleties in that, but does that more or less make sense? On, on a camera, we have to shift everything to this one amplifier. So on a CCD, there is this one amplifier. Um, and uh, CCDs have been the sort of de facto for quite a while, but as many of you have probably seen, CMOS cameras are um, getting much more popular. Uh, and the fundamental difference between a CCD and a CMOS is has, has to do with this readout. So on a CCD, you have a single amplifier and all the electrons need to be transferred to it. On a CMOS, every single photodiode comes with its own amplifier and every column additionally has an amplifier and an analog to digital converter. And sometimes you have 
another one going the other way. So it's like the top half will read out here and the bottom half will read out here. So the point is that CMOS has a massive amount of parallelization of the readout electrons. So that conversion is going on in every single one at the same time. Now, why would that be useful? There is there is a slide I'm realizing I, I, I pulled out here that you sort of need to intuitively know why this would be. Um, but I will just tell you what it is, which is that the faster you ask something to read out, the noisier it is. Think, you know, it sort of makes intuitive sense. If I need to like shift these electrons around really, really fast, I'm gonna I'm gonna just lose some, gain some, and it's gonna be a little bit noisy. And if I get to go slowly, it's quiet and I can be more precise. So in a CMOS, if you get to do this readout process in parallel across every pixel at the same time, that each one can go much, much slower. And so they essentially have much lower read noise. So if you look at the specification sheet of CMOS cameras, on average, they have dramatically lower read noise, which means that you can now detect weaker and weaker signals successfully. The parallelization also gives you very fast frame rates because now they're all working in tandem and you don't have to line up and wait to, to be read. So basically these give you this, this seemingly lack of compromise. It is they're pretty awesome. Low read noise, fast frame rate, and a very large field of view. So that's the that's like why CMOS are very exciting. Um, it, it, the cost here is is that essentially now because you have millions of individual readout electronics on your chip, the chip is now in 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 homogeneous. In, ah, it, it has variable read. Uh, the the noise varies across the chip. So. Um, on the left here is the, the, the depiction of a noise map. In other words, I'm saying for each pixel here, the brighter it is, the noisier it is. And you can measure this on your chip. And what I want you to see here is that on a CMOS, most, this is not an image. This is a, this is a depiction of noise on the chip. It's a, I've measured noise in each pixel and I'm showing you higher noise as brighter pixels. Um, and so on the right, you can see that the CCD on average has much higher noise but it's a normal distribution. Every pixel has essentially the same noise characteristics as every other pixel. On the left, I've got a lot of very quiet pixels and a couple really noisy ones. So we have a right tail of the distribution. And whether this matters to you really depends on the kind of imaging you're doing. If you're doing like localization microscopy where you're doing careful Gaussian fitting and stuff, it matters. On the other hand, if you're just drawing a big region and taking the average intensity, it probably doesn't matter and the lower average is generally beneficial. Okay, any um, that, that we can talk more about CMOS offline, but that was the, the need to know bit. Any questions on that? Yeah. I mean, I think on average for the average application for something like co-localization, the answer is gonna depend on how you're analyzing co-localization. Are you using a Pearson? Are you using Manders? Like, um, but on average, I would I would wager to say generally it's going to be slightly better to have the less read noise. Yeah. Um, now I am about out of time, but I want to leave you with this um, one thought, and that is first for you to look at these two images and tell me which one has the better signal noise ratio. What, what are you saying? And why are you saying that? Because you think it's a trick. <laughs> Maybe. Like there's less black noise. There's less what? There's less black noise, so the offset frequency is not um, zero. Okay. Okay. So you're seeing that. Yeah. That might be a that might be a, a contrast of the monitor issue, but you're you're basically you're not liking that super black region there. Um, because maybe there's offset. Okay. Um, outside of offset, uh, visually, um, any any does everybody like the left image better? What do you think? So I was going to say, I can't remember if this was from the homework or something that might be cheating, but if, if you look at the individual variability in the picture on the left hand. <laughs> is this on one of the things? I guess it is. Uh, yes. Okay. Most people will look at these and like the right image better. Um, I, I, it's it sort of, I, I, I probably triggered you this is a trick. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, most people look at the right image and say it's more contrasty. It looks probably better. And I would draw your eye to this box region. And 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 again, when we do evaluate something, we have to, we always have to say, what am I trying to get out of this? And in many cases, you're trying to say, how much of something is there, right? Like how much action is there? 
And if you look in this region here, look at how much it's sort of blinking and like crazy here and less so over there. Now I simulated these images and I did it such that the one on the left had twice the signal to noise ratio of the one on the right. The one on the right is simulated as an EMCCD, similar to a PMD, which we know has this ability to sort of amplify signal well above the noise. So we don't really see that noise in the background, but now the noise is in the signal itself, right? It's flashing super bright and then super dim and then super bright and then super dim. And the precision with which we can measure how much actin is actually much lower. It's a little easier to see that in something like this, like a homogeneous sample, right? Where if I just tell you this is a flat sample, there's no variance in the sample. It's like, imagine like a square, right? And if I plot the line scan there, now you can sort of see in a line scan what you what you intuited on in the previous one, which is that, you know, the signal is about the same, right? The, the signal, which we define as, you know, baseline to the average here, right? The distance above local background, that's our signal. And the noise is the variance. So the variance in, in, the, in the thing itself is much higher on the right. Um, the the take-home message here is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually skip that in the interest of time. Uh, the the take-home message here is don't trust your eyes when it comes to evaluating quantitative metrics of an image, like signal to noise ratio. We love contrast. And we basically have incredible ability to kind of like average out noise in, in, in our brains. Um, so yeah, if there's one thing we can sort of encourage you to do, it's just like not really look at the image other than as an estimate of things and then measure things throughout. Um, and with that, I, I will stop because I'm out of time and we can talk about some of these more in the lab. Uh, actually. This this slide um, uh, you will you will in the lab talk about how signal to noise ratio is really 